Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for following us online today. Uh, this is our seventh time uh, to conduct the mid the author webinar series. And today uh, we have pleasure to invite Professor Branko uh, Vidanovic uh, to talk about uh, his new book and also have the discussion uh, with him. And lastly, uh, we will also open uh, the Q&A time uh, for the audience and I will collect uh, those uh, you following us online today and to bring some of the selected question uh, into the webinar. So really appreciate uh, for Professor Branco, uh, given uh, we know that it is the last evening in the United States. So really appreciate for your time uh, to join uh, today's webinar. So if you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Well, yes, I'm, I'm ready. First, I would like to thank you for the invitation. It is, of course, a pleasure to be, uh, I mean, online. I, I wish I were in China. I was in China a little bit less than two years ago. I was looking forward actually to coming back. But now, as you know, with the COVID situation, travel is pretty difficult or even impossible. But I hope next year I will be able to present it live. Uh, for, uh, this is, of course, a great opportunity for me to present books. So let me start with a general introduction and with the slides that I have here so that you will be able, I hope, actually, let me see, right. to see them. Let me, sometimes this does not uh, yes. work. Yes, works well. Thank you very much. Okay, does it, okay. So let me explain uh, what is the objective of the book and how it is structured. And I would speak, as we have agreed, up to about 25 to 30 minutes, because, of course, I would like then to have, uh, you know, your comments and also the comments from the other people. Uh, you know, the book is actually called, as you can see, Capitalism Alone, uh, and it has two very important and major themes. One is the capitalism as the mode of production, and I would actually explain that in a minute, saying why I use the word capitalism, because most of the production nowadays is carried on privately owned capital. It is also carried with legally free labor, so it is not slavery or serfdom where people were not free, and it is carried in a decentralized manner. So there is no central plan and other, you know, central rules. It's generally decentralized. Doesn't mean that everything is decentralized, but the main decisions are decentralized. And the second important theme, as you can see here in chapter one, is the rise of Asia. Now, the rise of Asia is obviously the rise of China and the increased income level in China, but it's also other Asian countries. It's also India, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, and so forth. And why it is important, it's important, of course, for geopolitical reasons. It's important for the role of the Pacific in the future. What is interesting, actually, when I was writing this book and, and rereading things, I found uh, my own note from many years ago which comes actually from Marx, who in, in uh, 1849 wrote about the future of the Pacific. Now, why is it in 1849? Because 1849 was the year when California got opened up. And he already saw then that the Pacific might actually replace what was the dominant, of course, ocean, which was the Atlantic. So that's the second topic. And the second topic is also important because what I called here the rebalancing of the world means that the relative incomes of China, India, and the rest of Asia would gradually, and they're already on that way now, but gradually would become the same as they were with respect to Europe before the Industrial Revolution. Just to give you an idea, like before the Industrial Revolution, if you took the income level of the Netherlands or the United Kingdom, which were the most developed parts of Europe, and compare that with the most developed parts of China, you would actually find that there was no difference. And actually, probably in the 13th century with the Song Dynasty in China, Chinese incomes were probably higher. But then what happened in the, in the 18th and 19th century is that of course the West got ahead, much richer, and India and China did not grow. So in that sense, it is a rebalancing of the world. As some people who might know me, I've actually been writing about global inequality and that theme 
of the rise of Asia has very strong and obvious implications also for global inequality. I will not talk about them now, but if there are some questions, of course, I will be very happy to answer. Then chapter two deals with what are called meritocratic and liberal capitalism. The terms come from John Rawls, who is a, a political philosopher, and the term meritocratic is often used in the current way of speaking as something which is necessarily good. In Rawls, it was still good, but it simply meant that there are no legal impediments to people acceding different positions in society. In other words, you know, in societies where you have caste structure, for example, you cannot get out of your caste. But meritocratic simply means that anybody, in theory, can get to any position or income. I will speak of that in, in more detail, but the, the, you can see, read here, what are the different chapters of that, um, uh, sub-chapters of that part of the book. And I'm mostly focused on inequalities in liberal capitalism. Like what are the main types of inequalities and how they can actually produce themselves so that we might get in a situation where an upper class is being formed in meritocratic or liberal capitalism, which then becomes to some extent a self-reproducing upper class. So I will talk about that mostly in a, in a minute, but let me explain the rest of the book. The rest of the book is then the chapter three, which really deals mostly with China. I will not uh, explain uh, all the details today because I have to say they're a little bit complex because I don't take simply like many other writers, I just take China today, the United States today and just compare. I actually go to the historical roots of sort of Chinese regime and the system. I go back to the 1920s and I try to explain why China, uh, in, like with other in, uh, countries like Vietnam, Algeria, Angola, Mozambique, uh, uh, Malaysia, was a case where the left wing or communist revolutions accomplished two objectives. And this is actually the first part of chapter three. One is to make the country independent or from outside influence which as I said, it's not only the case of China, but all these other countries that I mentioned, and also to get rid or end feudal or quasi-feudal institutions. They could be, as you know, that could be the role of landlords. It could be uh, usury, like lending of capital, the role of women. It could be ed education, which was very limited and so forth. So this is a really historical background I will not speak about that today, but I, you know, when people read this book, I hope they would actually pay attention to that because I think it's an important, uh, it plays an important role. Then I actually review also inequality in China in a similar way that I review inequality in the United States. I would say something about that today. Many of the things are actually quite well known in China. Uh, I'm using, as other researchers are using, the data that are published in China. I use quite a lot of data about income inequality, wealth inequality, even the data on corruption published in the Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese sources. Uh, obviously, I, I depend really on basically on what other people have collected because uh, I don't speak Chinese. I've bought actually several books which were actually in English in China and they actually, particularly in the area of corruption, they give you quite a lot of data and I've used them. And then finally in that chapter, I address one question which I think is interesting for the Chinese as it is for the Western audience, is what is the global attractiveness of the Chinese system? Is Chinese system going to have a sort of countries that, that uh, uh, copy it, that emulate it or not? And what would be the role of the, of the new investment initiatives, you know, um, like uh, uh, BRI and the role of these initiatives in Africa and Latin America and Eastern Europe. So this is a more general sort of section which uh, uh, deals with, you know, the current, uh, it was written before the trade 
situation with the United States became worse, but it was really the objective of the book is really to have a longer view and not simply just to look in the last six months. Then uh, the next chapter is about globalization in general. And there are four areas, as you can see. The first one is about migration of labor, which I think is a very important area, particularly for Europe and the United States. And migration, lots of African labor that comes to Europe and how it could actually be on one hand accepted because it is good that the labor moves. On the other hand, it leads to issues of culture or assimilation, jobs and so forth. The next uh, section is about global value chains. Uh, so, this sorry, is something. Uh, uh, do you already use the slide or maybe uh, because uh, yes. the sc screen still in the file explorer, maybe because you No, have... I'm actually in the same, but I will move to the slides, you okay. know, uh, to the other slides. Uh, just let me just finish with this. Okay, I would sorry. Then... I'm sorry about uh, it. Yeah, so it is now about the global value chains which are of course now particularly important because many of the, these global value chains are maybe now in the form of reassessment. The next chapter is about the welfare state in Western countries and the issues that they face with globalization and, 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 um, uh, the, and the movement of capital. And then finally, I say, and I will stop there, I say a few things about the future of global capitalism and about the, you know, the role of capitalism in our private lives. For example, I discuss there the role of, uh, of uh, uh, our leisure time becoming less and less leisure time because it is being used for commercial purposes. I'm talking about the uh, invasion of the internet in our private space. I'm talking about Airbnb and so on. But I will then move to the next uh, uh, group of slides, which would then basically uh, I'll review some of the themes. Uh, this is already mentioned. Uh, some of the themes from the chapter about liberal capitalism, and then I'll, I'll finish with a few things from the chapter on China or political capitalism. So let me just say that what is important to realize that capitalism today in Western countries is very different from capitalism from the 19th century. If you look at the 19th century data, you, uh, to the extent that we have them, you actually very, you have a very strong separation, split between people who have capital income and only capital income for capitalists and people who only have wage income and their workers. And on this graph, this is income on the horizontal axis and the number of people on the vertical axis. We couldn't see the slide. Uh, oh, you cannot see the slides? Right, right, because I think oh. now we just saw the uh, file. Oh, I'm sorry, that, let me just try to, this is a, sometimes an issue. Uh, right. can, you, uh, can you see it now? Uh, not yet, uh, maybe I see okay, it. Let me, let have, me do it again. You have two Let me screens. do it again. Right. Yes, that sometimes is an issue. Right. with <laughs> that it doesn't want to bring the, okay, screen sharing. Let me stop sharing and then I will restart. Right, thank you and very much. Yes, I'm sorry for that. It actually happens to me uh, quite. Uh, can you see it now? Um, no, uh, we only see the file explorer screen. Let me try it again. So I would again uh, close the, you know, I will stop sharing. So now you can simply see me. And then I would do share screen. Sure. And I hope that this would work now. It says you're, it, does it work now? Um, no. Not. <laughs> yes. Um. You know, it, it is something. Let me see, new share. Maybe I will do new share. Okay. Now? Okay, now it's no problem. Now you can see it. Yes, perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, well, I'm very happy uh, because it's, anyway, you never know if it would say it or not. So in, on this slide, what it, what it shows is like a typical uh, income structure of the 19th century capitalism. You have capitalists who are actually all richer than workers, but what is important also is that capitalists have income only from capital and workers have income only from labor. That's very important to realize the 19th century structure. 
And I think very, I think that's probably the case, we don't have the data, but if you were to look probably in China in 1920s or 1910, you would have a similar situation that the rich people have income from property and they don't have any income from labor. And people who are poorer actually have only income from labor. And it's, it's a very important division. And we now noticed actually in, uh, I will come to, uh, I'll skip some of the things. We now notice in uh, countries like the United States and countries like China, I have actually the data, which maybe I'll show you today, is that the, the rich people nowadays have both types of income. They have capital income and they have labor income. That makes it sometimes more difficult actually to manage because you have people who deserve in some sense both. You actually see them working very hard, but on top of that, they are also people who have income from property. Uh, and this is really a new feature. As I said before, like 100 years ago, you didn't have that. If you were the owner of a big factory, you were not going to go into work somewhere else. You were either like lending the money or you were managing assets. Nowadays, you have people, for example, who are professionals and who also have some capital income, they invest in real, in real estate, they invest in the stock market and they have income from that. So now there are like six, I will not go over all of them because it's, it's a little bit long, six systemic inequalities in liberal capitalism. One, the first one very briefly is the rising share of capital in national income. This is something which is true for practically all countries, including China that capital share in national income has gone up. And this is something which has gone up in the last 30 years, as I said, for most countries. The second point is that capital increase is not neutral. It actually goes into the hands of people who have capital and who tend to be very highly concentrated. So you will see, for example, some numbers for the United States where 10% of people at the top have 90% of total income. Well, that means that if that particular income goes up, then, I mean, the, the capital income goes up, then you have automatically an increase in inequality between individuals. Another interesting feature is the rising rate of return on the assets of the rich. So let me then go for the other in more detail. Uh, first, let me show you here on several countries that you have an increasing the, the, the numbers are here the, the, on the slide, is the Gini coefficient of capital in, in blue and the Gini coefficient of labor in red. Now, the Gini coefficient is a measure of inequality. As this number goes up, uh, the, that particular source of income becomes more concentrated and more unequal. What you see here on the blue, la, blue dots is that capital income is so heavily concentrated that a genie is close to one. One is the maximum genie. You cannot go above that because it's like a ceiling. It means that the entire capital income is the hands of one person. That of course is not realistic, but you see that it's pretty high. It's 0.9. For labor, that genie coefficient is between 0.4 and 5 and 6. So labor is less unequal than capital. But as you notice, labor has actually become more concentrated as time went by here, this from 1980 to 2000. So the, the, the other effect is that the higher return on the assets of the rich. This is a complicated graph, so forget about them because it, I will just explain what I mean. Is that the, the uh, basic structure of asset holding is as follows. You have uh, 30 or in China, probably 50% of the population without net assets. Other people have housing. When I say, no, I mean, I exclude land. So I'm excluding land. I'm just looking at two types, housing and financial assets. So really to come to people who have predominantly financial assets, you have to go very high in income distribution at the top 5%. All the rest who have some assets essentially have housing. So then what happens is the issue, which of these two types of assets? is increasing faster in value. Is it uh, assets, financial assets, could be like stock market or interest rates or dividends and so on, or is it the housing? And then depending on which one of these two goes up, 
you would have a rising share of the top or the rising share of the middle. But on top, in addition to that, very often what you find, and I think that's something that many of you would see in real life, is that people who have more assets are able to find uh, sources of investments, they pay higher return on them. So in other words, if you have, for example, you know, I mean, uh, 10,000 yuan and you have 10 million, you would probably find a source that would give you higher return, let's suppose 8% rather than 5% if you have more wealth. And that of course is, is in itself adding to further concentration or inequality. So this is something which is a new phenomenon. We did not have the data about uh, that in, in the past. So this is a graph which illustrates that. You notice the rate of return and on the, on the horizontal axis is total wealth percentile. So people at the very top are the top, the richest people. And you notice their return on each dollar invested is higher than for people who are in the middle. It's a very interesting phenomenon. I think it really needs to be researched much more because it is something which is really empirically quite new. And there are some explanations why this could be the case because you know the entry costs are very high. If you have small amount of money, you cannot hire somebody to advise you and you cannot get to high yielding assets. Um, but I want to point out to two very important now uh, developments when this part and I'll move to China in a minute is what I actually, this is the first time that it's been studied in a book or in a paper is that a high capital and labor income is increasingly being received by the same people. What the graph shows, it, this is the years, and then it shows percentage of people who are in the top income group, top 10%, and who are also in the top income group by capital and labor. Mm -hmm. So what you notice here is that you have more and more people who are actually both rich in terms of labor income, let's suppose your chief executive office is somewhere, and you also have large capital assets. Mm -hmm. So that means that you have a sort of a concentration in the hands of relatively few people of both capital and labor, which as I was saying in the very beginning, it's very different from what it used to be in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, inequality maybe was higher, but it was differently organized. In other words, you didn't have what I called here homoplutia. And now, this is actually now the data from different countries. I will skip that, but there I want to finish with a story about the, uh, about the United States and liberal capitalism with one interesting phenomenon, which I think actually I've seen actually some studies is true also for China. And this is the fact that more and more young people uh, uh, marry each other who are very similar in terms of income and education. Now, this is good because of course, you, you know, freedom to marry whom you want is a good thing. But I want you to think in terms of income inequality. If you have two individuals who are actually equally educated and who are both making quite a lot of money, when they marry each other, they of course add to total inequality. As I said, it's not the reason not to have them, but it's actually, we have to realize that it does add to inequality. So here on this graph, I show for the uh, young uh, uh, American men in 1970s who were between 20 and 35 years of age, they had an equal percentage likelihood of marrying women from the bottom of the income distribution, that's the blue line, or from the top of the income distribution. So about the same. So let's suppose you are young, you're very rich, you're doing very well, you're male, you have about one chance to marry somebody who is a woman who is relatively from a poor income level or from a rich income level. Well, how does it look today? Today is three to one greater likelihood of marrying somebody who is rich. So this is a big change. And of course, it's the same now from the women's perspective. This is now the same graph, but from the women's perspective, where the gap is even higher. The gap is now five to one. In other words, women, who are actually earning quite a lot of money are essentially marrying other men who are also earning quite a lot of money. So to end the story, if you then put all these things together and say, we have a rising uh, share of capital income. That capital income is mostly received by the people who are rich. 
uh, people who are rich also receive higher return on their assets. And they marry each other, then you have really all the ingredients, like when you cook something, you have all the ingredients to make inequality higher and to transmit that inequality to your children and to make sure that they also have high capital income, high labor income, that you invest lots of effort in their education. And then you create a class which is very difficult to displace. So this was my argument for liberal capitalism, how inequality over time leads to the class formation and to the change in the system. So I now hope I would be able to go back, let me just stop sharing this and go back to another uh, uh, screen, which uh, I would take only five minutes now. And I want simply to show a few slides from China. Can you see them? Is it, uh, are you not, sharing? Not yet. not yet. Maybe we'll have the same problem again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't understand why it sometimes just does not want to, sh to show. Okay, now uh, it, it you can see. Now. Yes. So let me show you some slides that I use for inequality in China. Some of them are quite well known. Uh, first, I show the, the declining share of uh, uh, state-owned enterprises employment in total urban employment. Anyway, as you can see, these are the official data. It is quite well known for, to everybody that actually that share went from being 80% to 20%. I show that the same story when you include the entire Chinese uh, uh, employment, both rural and urban, but uh, the, this is the share of industrial output, which is produced by state-owned enterprises also, which is much less now than it was in 98. But I want to move to inequality. So the inequality in China, as you know, has actually increased very significantly compared to where it was in the, 18, in the 1980s or even 1990s. Uh, this is showing inequality of uh, uh, gross income or actually wage income in state-owned enterprises and in the private enterprises. So what you notice here is that both of them have gone up but the private, of course, which is always the case, is having a higher inequality of wage income and its level of inequality is higher than in the state-owned enterprises. And as the private sector becomes more important in China, that of course adds to the total amount of inequality. Uh, differently, of course, we have the data which come from the Chinese uh, household surveys we don't have them, as you probably know, we don't have them every year because although the data are assembled or collected every year, they are not published every year. And we have, as you can see here, an unusual break in the data from rural, rural income inequality. But again, you notice for the urban income inequality, a significant increase between 1990 and, 2000 and about 2005. And after that, you really do not see any significant increase, or actually you even see more recently a decline in urban income inequality. I will just finish with that by saying that, of course, many people have argued that this is the end of the period where China in the urban areas could grow by withdrawing labor from the countryside and essentially not increasing very much or much less than uh, uh, the, the bottom wage. Now, if at some point one runs out of that inflow from the rural areas, then the, the bottom wage, unskilled wage, starts rising in relationship to the top wage. And we see some indications of that, that the urban income inequality is less. The final point is actually with the similarities that I sort of think between the, the two types of system is that in the uh, liberal capitalism, very often the power, economic power, translates into political power. In the Chinese type systems, very often political power translates into economic power. So there are certain similarities and actually one can see some levels of convergence, but there are also strong differences between the two. So I would actually, I see now it's exactly, you know, half an hour since I started. So I would like to stop here. I want to again to say that what I've shown regarding China is very little because the first part is more 
a part which is less empirical and it's a part about the, the history and the origin. And uh, that part, of course, is difficult to present. And of course, I would prefer that you read it in the book. So thank you very much. I'm sorry if I spoke too fast, but I was afraid I might not have enough time to say everything. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Branco, for your very impressive and also informative presentation. Also very uh, many interesting statistics. Uh, I just noticed that uh, you mentioned uh, in your book and also in your presentation that uh, the rich uh, male or rich female, they tend to get married with those, uh, also have the same, share the same background with them. I think probably that will destroy the dream of young lady in China. As you know that uh, a lot of novel here is always like uh, a rich and handsome young CEO, uh, like start um, meet with his, uh, his Miss Wright and uh, have some romantic story. Uh, but I think sometimes we still shall come back to the reality and to see the statistic. So uh, my first question here is that uh, in your book, uh, The Lattice One Capitalism Alone and also the Global Inequalities uh, also mention a lot of uh, about capitalism. And as we know that capitalism is uh, especially uh, getting, uh, getting the mainstream or getting popular uh, like two, 300 years ago, uh, maybe uh, can associate with the industry revolution. Right. So my question here is, what do you think is maybe the infrastructure or the three pillars to support the capitalism? You know, uh, let me just say, I mean, first on the, on the first point that you raised, which I think is a very interesting point, particularly for young people about the marriage. You know, it is, a, uh, you know, it is factually the case and I think the, what has happened, and I, we have some studies about that, is that uh, the w participation of women in educational system and in working has become much more important. So women have much more choice now whom to marry. They get married later in life and they spend more time studying. So you don't have the situation like in the past where you had women who are 18 and they immediately get married. Now they, they wait until 25, 28, 30, and men do the same. And then they have very similar preferences. You know, I also married my wife because we met at work, you know, and we had very similar backgrounds. So it is very natural and a good development. But I will have to say that actually in some sense, it adds to inequality because those who are poor and who don't have these opportunities, they have only themselves to marry, you know? So then what happens is of course you increase inequality. Now to go to your uh, second question, I um, uh, define capitalism actually basically following very simply Marx and Marx Weber, and they have three uh, sort of um, uh, three pillars, as you said. Mm. The first one is that you produce with the privately owned means of production or privately owned capital. Doesn't mean everything is produced like that, but the dominant part of the economy is private. The second one is that the labor that is working there is the labor that is legally free and that you hire. So you hire them for one month, a year, or maybe for long term, but they are not having a management role. So you, if you're the owner, you have, you're the manager. So that's important that actually they don't have a management role. And the third point is, as I mentioned before, decentralized coordination. So that means, again, doesn't mean that the state doesn't decide anything. As you know, now with the coronavirus, we have in the United States a 15% of GDP of state increased spending. So the state is obviously huge, but normally the state does not tell you you're going to produce this or that. So in that sense, it is decentralized. So these are the, the kind of a pillar. A pillar. Sometimes people add, for example, the role of investment, uh, but you know we can add that as well. But I think we should really have a clear definition, and I hope I actually had a clear one here. Right, right. Thank you very much, for Professor Branco, your uh, explanation. So the next question is uh, really focusing on that. In the last chapter of your new book, that uh, you also propose 
and also categorize a uh, couple paradigm of capital capitalism and also uh, maybe a couple of the paradigm that uh, you uh, wish maybe some of the uh, government or the society will take into consideration. So would you like to elaborate on those um, couple paradigm of capitalism? Yeah, I actually in the last chapter of the book is, is a little bit different as you said from the rest because I really uh, discuss relatively new phenomena. Uh, new phenomena where uh, we had, uh, um, if I can call it like that, the invasion of sort of capital and capitalist relations, even in our private life. For example, you have people who make uh, contracts before they get married. You have people who go to work and then sign a contract which says they are not going to reveal anything about this work or they reveal something, but then you pay them and then they say, well, we are not going to say anything anymore. This has happened very often recently that actually people, uh, you know, it was done in sexual harassment suits. It was done in a, a sort of trade union issues that people sign off the sort of the legal agreement not to be sort of uh, um, saying anything about that company or their private life. So this is something new in the sense that we didn't have this kind of um, invasion of the outside of the legal sphere in our private life. You know, historically, you were not saying something and you were, you know, maybe quiet about saying things bad about your family, but there was no legal thing. There was no, you could not be put in jail. You may be actually disliked by the other people, right. uh, but there was no legal. And then other things, for example, we now are renting out our apartments, homes. This was also something new until you had this development on the internet with Airbnb and other things which in China exist. I don't know the names, but many of them. You were, had your own apartment and maybe you would have your friends or you know, family come. But now it becomes a capital. And you know, I'm saying it's psychologically a huge difference. You know, I have not rented my apartment yet, but it's a really question of price because I now become aware that my decision not to rent it is a cost. So I know I could make, for example, $1,000 and I keep this in my mind. So it is a cost. I have not done it yet, but there is a price at which I would do it. So that's you know, another sort of commercialization of private space. Uh, another thing is of course with cars, you know, that people of course now you know, drive and do everything, which is also interesting, which the other side, and I'll stop there, is that you have now jobs that are, uh, sort of minimalistic in the sense that in the past you had a job, you're there for eight hours, this is like decided. Well, now these, many of these jobs are precisely because we have full commercialization. And I've actually talked to people who were in China, for example, during the, the lockdown, and I see that myself here now, uh, everything can be delivered electronically. You need food, it's delivered. You need wine, it's delivered. You need whatever good. And so that's actually very good you know, because we were not able to do that in the past. But for people who do this stuff, these are tiny jobs. Like I am now delivering pizza for three hours. After that, I will go to drive the car for two hours. After that, I will do, I will take dogs out for another two hours. So that is the other side of this commercialization. Really very, very small jobs that exist and every minute now can become commercialized. Right, right. Thank you very much for Professor Branco, your uh, very uh, explanation in details. So uh, the next question is going back to your uh, first question's answer, uh, talking about uh, COVID-19. So do you see that uh, as we are experiencing uh, COVID-19 in 2020, a lot of things are changing, transforming, and the paradigm is being redesigned. So do you see that there is any trend uh, mentioned in your book is accelerated or maybe it's like the, it's also changing as well. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that? No, it's an excellent question. You know, the book was written actually before COVID 
in the new translations now that appeared, I had a small introduction, which is only a few pages. Uh, there are certain things which I think have changed and there are certain things, as you said, which have been accelerated. I will say in general that the longer the crisis lasts, the more obviously things would change. Think of this, if the crisis was only three months, probably nothing would have changed. But if the crisis becomes three years, then lots of things will change. Uh, I don't believe, however, that the underlying forces of globalization would change because they are based on profit and interest, which is universal. And so long as you have ability, I mean, not you, but I mean, in general, one has the ability to send their own capital somewhere else, to, to make more money with that capital, to find labor and the structure that is actually giving more profit that these forces are not going to disappear. So I don't think that actually uh, globalization is in danger. I even think that in some sense, it can even become stronger. I mean, take our example. Without probably COVID, we would not be doing this what we are doing now. Right. Because we had very few of these Zoom conferences. We actually mentally thought, okay, if you want me to give a speech, ma'am, I will come to China. But now, mentally, we are thinking about Zoom, you know, and I'm sure that when this is over, we would still have hundreds of conferences like now, because we have suddenly, technology has improved, and we have realized that we can do it. So I think there are many forces there which would push globalization to continue as it did before. So I'm not pessimistic like some people. I actually see even, as I said, I mean, even, even what we were just saying, and of course on China, you live there, uh, what I was actually saying about the ability to deliver food, to deliver products, not to have shortages, is actually something which is greater now than it was before. Right, right. Thank you, Professor Branco. Uh, so the next one, maybe uh, we would like to uh, see not only uh, during COVID-19, but also the trend in the last uh, two, three years. As we know that uh, nowadays the protectionalism or the nationalism, for example, uh, people, they don't like immigration and also for uh, the international trade between countries, also like uh, maybe a kind of not that free as uh, usual as before. So what do you think about that? Do you think that uh, is that will also accelerate the phenomenon you mentioned in the book, or uh, what kind of suggestion that uh, you want to propose? You know, one thing that actually which has happened since, and it was really a very negative development, is the trade and the political tensions between China and the United States. This is something, when I wrote the book, and I'm still presenting, I'm presenting that as a two different or alternative or systems. but you know, nowadays with the tensions, uh, this has become much worse. So it's not like, you know, simply, you know, one system, another system, it's just now there is a political tension. So I think this is really very bad development. I think it's very bad development for the United States. I think it's bad development for China. It's the, I think it's bad development for the world. Uh, I hope that this would change. Uh, maybe with the new administration in the US, I hope we would go to some more normal policies. And if we go to some normal policies, you know, there would be still issues and tensions and there will be the problems with the World Trade Organization and there will be problems with intellectual property rights and there will be problems with Chinese imports into the United States. But I think we would go to normally trying to solve these issues through institutions and not through different political uh, threats. So in that sense, I have to say that I'm I, I see the negative impact of COVID because I think that for some reason, uh, some people in the United States almost blame China for this. And then when you start blaming somebody, then you really sort of become angry and then you make things worse. So I think this is really bad. Uh, if I were to actually single one bad thing, I think this is bad. You know, I, I'm obviously a bad thing is also that people have died. There is, but I'm saying this is something which really might have very negative effects. Right, thank you very much. 
So I think uh, I think this is also um, uh, very good and to get uh, learn a lot from you. And uh, here uh, I also got a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one, as you are uh, addressing in your book and also in your presentation slide, let you mention uh, the capital, uh, the income generated by capital and also the income generated by uh, how many hours that you contribute for the labor work. Uh, that uh, the, the proportion of in some countries right. uh, compared to other country uh, is largely different. So what do you think that make it happen? And uh, if maybe let's say if we are a country that have a huge uh, gap between uh, those people can get a capital income and those people normally based on their labor income, how do we uh, maybe minimize the gap uh, of that? Yes, I think it's, it's a, a excellent question because, you know, what we notice that the share of capital is going up. We notice that in practically all countries. And, you know, there are technological reasons behind that. I think that, uh, that there are some papers about that. Technological reasons are that we have more and more capital equipment, that we have automation, that we have robots, and that gradually the share of total income or contribution of capital becomes great. Now, the problem is, this is actually very good development if, if basically people can work less and then we can have machines to work for us. But the problem with the rising capital share is that it is very strongly concentrated among relatively few people. So my answer to your question, and I feel that's something in the book, is that that capital share should become less concentrated. Now, let me give an example. I know this is like a theoretical extreme, but let's suppose that everybody has more or less the same capital share. Then as the capital share goes up, it's not a problem. You know, you have 10, I have nine, and then you have 20, and I have 18. You know, the, the distances are still the same. We all get re richer, so it's not a problem. The problem becomes when you have 10 and I have zero and things double and you have 20 and I still have zero. So really the, the issue I think there is um, uh, equalization, I mean, not full, but some reduction of inequality between in capital income. How can it be done? It can be done by having more shares, give, I mean, uh, given with advantages to the middle class. It can be done by workers having shares in the companies where they work. So there are several alternatives. Can, one can use really taxation to have more people from the middle class participate in ownership. So I think there are ways to do that. It's not easy because many people who don't have much money, they don't want to invest in, 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 uh, you know, in shares or in assets uh, because they're afraid you know, these assets can go down. You can also solve that by, giving, uh, by making sure that if you're a small investor, you would not lose the entire investment. If you're a small investment investor, you can have a floor. You can maybe lose 30%, but not 100%. But if you're a big investor, there is no reason to give the, 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 the floor because the big investors always take risk. So I think there are ways of doing that. As I said, it's not easy, but you know, people have tried a little bit and I think we should do more. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Branco. So the next question from the audience uh, is really focusing on that the concept you addressing in your book in terms of the citizen premium and also the citizen penalty. Uh, I'm not sure if that the term uh, I use. Yes, is yes, correct. yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So uh, in terms of that, uh, the audience is one. Uh, just want to know. Uh, because firstly, when we think about like the income, how much income, uh, maybe the difference between uh, two countries is also associated with their uh, living expense. But as you uh, maybe uh, mentioned in the book, uh, you say uh, maybe um, even we compare with the living expense, but still some countries, their income is right. higher than other countries. So what do you think uh, make that happen? This is the first question. And the second question, uh, the people, the citizen also uh, want to know, this audience want to know, is that uh, this seems to make a lot of talent uh, in 
one country maybe they are attracting by the high income and high salary uh, to another countries. So how do we maybe attract Thailand to work uh, in their hometown? Because I think uh, maybe let's say in East Asia, I think a lot of like the young people, when they go to uh, the European country, when they go to the United States or even go to Japan, uh, eventually when they uh, graduate, they got their PhD, they tend to work local uh, for the local company. So how do the, their home or mother country, they can think about the measure and to keep those talent to work with their hometown? Yes, yeah, the, the second question is, is more difficult because it really deals with a, a sort of within national, you know, differences. Uh, the first one, uh, the, the premium, as you were saying, the citizenship right. premium or the penalty has to do with the fact that there, you know, if you're exactly the same individual in a rich country, your income is going to be higher than in a poor country. That's, everybody knows that. You know, and we have studies of that. This is really very commonsensical. Let's suppose you're a bus driver. If you're a bus driver, you would do, you would make more money in England than in uh, in Africa. Right. Uh, you could be equally uh, qualified, but you would just make more money there, and you would make more money even after you adjust for the differences in price levels between the two. Uh, so. But what is actually interesting, and that's what I discuss in the book, and that's what actually household survey data allow you to do, is that you notice that that difference that we actually now think of is the average difference. But the difference at every point of the distribution is different. So in very unequal countries, if you are at the very top of the income distribution, you can be in a poorer country, but you can have the same income as a German or an American. And the uh, people who are very poor, maybe may very, very poor, that actually they may be the uh, same income as people from very poor countries. So it is, you know, in that sense, it's different. I recently had lots of discussion because I wrote that for Chile, for example, which is a middle income country, it's, you know, it's about like, uh, about Chinese, you know, income level. Uh, the very top, and actually it's true also in China, the very top have incomes which are like incomes in Chile at the very top are the same as incomes at the very top in, um, uh, in Germany. But the very bottom in Chile have the incomes which are the same as the bottom in, in Mongolia. Not everybody, every, uh, average, but the bottom. So that means that actually the, the, the income distribution within the country matters a lot. And of course, we see in, in statistics, for example, at the very top of the Chinese urban distribution is now in the global top 1%. So it is obviously very, very high, uh, but people who are very bottom in rural areas are, I cannot now remember, but they are like, for example, in the 25th or the 30th percentile in the world income distribution. So just the comparison between the average to average is not sufficient. That's the premium. But that premium itself varies depending where you are in the distribution. Sometimes you may be, as I said before, you can be in a poorer country, but the premium could be zero if you're in a position in the distribution, which is actually quite good. Right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Branco. So I think the next question, uh, the audience uh, just want to know that, uh, as we know that the AI, the algorithm, uh, is also getting popular, especially in uh, recent, uh, maybe the last three, five years, a lot of AI application is applied in the society. So I think that his background is much more related to finance uh, because as we know now, there's, uh, let's say in China, uh, Alibaba yeah. and financial, when they uh, do the loan approval, they normally uh, sometimes they use yeah. the algorithm uh, to decide whether we want to uh, approve the loan application from the individual. But uh, the question from the audience is that uh, it seems to us that the algorithm, uh, the mechanism, how we decide the loan approval, uh, people, they don't know it, uh, what's going inside, uh, and it seems like a black box. So what do you think about that? Shall, shall we keep those um, uh, algorithms as the trust secret? owned by business or shall we disclose 
And maybe based on the capital listen concept, what do you think about that? Yeah, th this is really a very difficult question because of course, as you said, the algorithm really makes the entire difference. Uh, when we speak of, of artificial intelligence, it is not something which is like a God that we don't know what is there. We actually design it, you know, with that black box is filled by us. Uh, the problem with revealing that, as you know, it is the problem is basically property rights. Uh, you know, different people would, let's suppose the same problem is the allocation you want to give uh, loans. And one person has a good algorithm that is able to tell if somebody is not likely to pay the loan, another person has a bad algorithm and actually loses money. So giving, uh, I can totally understand from the point of view of somebody who has a good algorithm, you really don't want to share that because that knowledge is like basically yours. Like, uh, you know, when I publish a book, I also receive some income from that book. You know, so it is actually, uh, the, the trade-off is like in many of these patent rights, it's the same with now with vaccines, with the, with the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to you have a trade-off. On the one hand, in uh, social needs are sometimes so overwhelming, like for example, with COVID, that you really have to say, okay, I really, uh, you know, I, I will give you some money, but you cannot maximize your return simply because the social needs are so big, people are going to die. But in other cases, you have to go in the other direction because if you impose on, on Google and others to reveal the algorithms, then they would of course not do it or maybe they will do it worse or maybe they will not have incentive to improve. So I think it's a very difficult situation, but I think only in cases of emergency uh, do we need uh, to go totally against uh, that kind of, of, of property right. I, as I said, I'm not really saying that we should let these property rights last forever, nor that they should be really sort of never released. But I, I see the problem that actually if you do it really, if you have a pressure on them to release them, that you might actually do worse than, than not letting them. Right, thank you very much, Professor Branco. And I think uh, one of the, uh, the last question is that, uh, I think uh, coming back to your, um, the, the concept addressing in your book uh, in terms of citizen premium and the citizen penalties. Uh, when I read your book, uh, I was thinking, uh, how could we fix it? Or uh, is there any possibility to transform uh, the situation? So uh, I just try to connect uh, because it seems COVID-19, a lot of like uh, the citizen overseas, they are going back to their home country uh, because of COVID-19 yeah, yeah. situation, especially for people living in the United States. So I just try to think about, uh, do you think that the remote work uh, can somehow oh. fix uh, this phenomenon? Of course, we know that uh, for remote yes. work, we also see a lot of people uh, working overseas, but when they're back to their country because of the skill or because of working style, uh, maybe that industry doesn't allow him or her to work remotely. So what do you think that remote work uh, and also yeah. its connection with your, your, your book's concept? Yeah, I, you know, that's something that actually, as I was saying before, uh, we could actually have, unlike what many people think, we could actually have transformative effects of this crisis to push us more toward globalization. And I think this remote work is a very good example because we already had it. And you had, for example, countries, uh, Belarus is one example, Romania another, where you had East European countries with quite well-educated labor, and they essentially were working on all these software programs from home. So they would be paid less than people in the United States, but they would be paid more than people in their own country, so they would be actually quite happy. And now I think that it technically, you can imagine, this is like a really far in advance, but you can imagine the world which really behaves practically as a single labor market with people staying where they are. Now, of course, not for everything can be like that because there are things that you need physical presence. But for many of the things, I think we are discovering that you might do them without being physically present. Uh, you know, I, I'll tell you, for example, from, you know, my own side, my son, his friends and all others, they're not working anymore in the offices. 
So they could be anywhere. They could be actually today <coughs> in New York, they could be in Mexico, they could be in Tokyo, they could be in China. So that has really already changed. Right. Um, so in that sense, you know, going back to your question about migration, I think there could be impact on migration as well. So you might actually uh, not want to migrate, maybe you actually even prefer to be in your own country and plus take into account that lower salary in your own country, if you're just working remotely with the price level which is lower, would actually give you more income than if you were to migrate. So, you know, we might actually see more of that. Now, of course, I don't say that it would be like full because as I was saying, you know, if you look, for example, in the US and Mexico, you need lots of Mexican labor to work in the fields. Now, you cannot really work in a field remotely. Obviously, you have to go in the field and physically pick up, you know, the avocado or cabbage or whatever. So some things cannot be done remotely, but maybe others can. Right. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Branco. Because indeed, for myself, while well, I, I'm teaching uh, uh, for Zhejiang University, but because of COVID-19, I still uh, stay, stay in my hometown. Uh, but somehow, I feel like working remotely actually is even more tired than uh, working in the office. Because when you work in the office, when you step out from the office, which means that you are free, right? But when, yes. when like the remote work and we also put our life uh, inside, it seems that mix, uh, mix and uh, we need to maybe figure out what's the new paradigm for our work. I, I totally agree. And actually, you know, what is also a problem is that uh, you have to minimize contact with other people. So right. essentially your work and your home and your private life are so much now combined and you cannot get as a sort of some relaxation by doing something else. You can, for example, here, you, I cannot go to a movie theater. I cannot go to, you know, to theater. I can go to a restaurant, but you're very careful about where you go. So really, it has really changed um, badly. We, we, we need some, you know, uh, relaxation from this combination of work and, and uh, home. Right, right. Thank you very much, Professor Branco. And uh, I hope that uh, in the future, we have pleasure to host you uh, either in uh, Hangzhou, that where our university is located, or maybe anywhere in the world uh, after COVID-19 is well controlled. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I really appreciate it once again. And all the best. And I hope really to see you soon physically in real life. Right, right. Thank you. Really appreciate. So have a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Or good, night. good day. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.